Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, a look at high fashion, farmer style, and the rights and wrongs of wearing the American cultural costume, the overall. Just why do Americans like to shoot bullet holes in signs? Roger looks into this strange custom. We'll stop by for some hot coffee and warm conversation at Eric's Big Table, where they elect U.S. presidents and solve the world's problems. And finally, a stop along the side of the tracks for a unique idea on what to do with those empty coal trains heading back to the West. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. Most of the countries of the world have official folk costumes. They usually involve dresses that would look good on waitresses and men's outfits that smack vaguely of horseback riding. Now, sometimes these costumes have their foundations in historical clothing, but as often as not, they're developed by tourist bureaus to convince American travelers that these people are actually harmless and that they had nothing whatsoever to do with the Second World War. The costumes are replete with lace and patent leather, ribbons, shiny boots, applique vests and bright colors, ribbons. The people who wear these costumes are always dancing, never working. Now think about it a minute. Here are these outfits that the country people of Norway or Germany or Czechoslovakia or Bolivia are supposed to wear. But are these the sorts of things you are likely to wear while digging potatoes, cutting wood, or cleaning chickens? Not likely. There are real folk costumes, and to find them, you've got to go where the people are working. Is there a real American folk costume? You bet there is. Bib overalls, bibbers as they're called by the people who wear them. And there are rules about how to wear these things that the people who wear them know very well. You don't find those rules in Vogue magazine social notes or in the Playboy Advisor or Miss Manners or even in the Nebraska Farmer, but they all understand those rules very well. For example, when you're just wearing overalls on a day-to-day -day basis, you leave the side buttons undone. But if you're gonna go to town, then you button one button on each side. And if it's a particularly fancy affair, then you do up both buttons on each side. If it's a really fancy affair, what you can do is buy a new pair of overalls and leave the tags on. That shows how much you cared. New overalls. But they're good for almost every occasion, too. K. Dick Whitefoot over at Bolas owns about the best steakhouse in the area, and I don't know how many times I've been sitting in there when some farmer comes in and apologetically asks, is it all right if I come in to eat with my overalls on? And Dick answers logically, that's the way you earn your money, that's the way you can spend it. There are a lot of advantages to wearing overalls. For example, there's always talk around here of rain when someone comes in with their overall strap twisted like this one because they say you twist one of your straps to keep from getting hit by lightning. And there's always some place to put your hands, sort of the same function that a martini has at a cocktail party. For example, there's the thumb hook, like this. And then there's the cliffhanger, like this. It's like carrying around your own backyard fence to lean over when you're talking. And there's the belly warmer. I like to use that pose when I'm sitting down in front of the fire. And finally, there's the cowboy, kind of a dashing look like this. And then there are all these pockets. For example, over here, there's a place for a couple of pencils. In here, there's room for a pocket watch. I don't carry a pocket watch, but sometimes you can put other things in there too. And here's a little slot where you fasten the chain that then goes down here to hook onto your pocket watch. Down here, you got the hammer loop and you never put anything in the hammer loop but a hammer. And on the other side, you got two pliers pockets, and you never put anything in a pliers pocket but pliers. My wife Linda reminds me that women never wear overalls. She has a few pair that she used to wear when she was in college, and she wears them around the house, but she'd never wear them into town. And the folks in town have different reasons for their preference of overalls. 
Oshkosh, Bagosh are popular because they're long wearing, although I think it's the poetry of the matter that attracts them, Oshkosh, Bagosh. And I have a friend, Jim Smith, who wears only big Smith overalls. He says there's no reason, but nobody believes him. Lee overalls are popular because of the hardware, strong buttons and hooks. Sears overalls are all right, except for the ones that have zippers, and it just doesn't seem right for overalls to have zippers. I like key overalls, mostly because of this little ribbon here. Key Imperials, the aristocrat of overalls. I like that, the aristocrat of overalls. Ancient cultures are often known by the peculiarities of their lifestyles and the evidence that they leave behind about those lifestyles. They're the mound builders and the basket weavers, the diggers and the flint chippers, all known for the artifacts that they've left behind. I've been wondering what future anthropologists are going to call us, and I think I figured it out. We're going to be known as the people who shot their signs. Across this country, steel, aluminum, and wooden signs are sinking into the soil, petrifying, and generally preparing themselves to be dug up in another millennium or two as evidence of how we lived. They say stop, slow, curve, things like that. Nebraska 58, they got the guy in the covered wagon on that one. Almost every single one of those signs that you see on a country road has bullet holes in it. Now here's a sign that tells you how far it is to my place. Danabrog, 10. And I'd say that's about a 30-30 or maybe a 30-10. I used to think these bullet holes were evidence of hunters improving their aim or maybe revolutionaries demonstrating their contempt for authority. But Nebraskans will tell you that you can lie in bed at night after the taverns have closed and you can hear the rifle shots out on the highway. I've even been witness to some of these holes being installed. This hole was shot into this sign from a moving car just a few yards from our house over there where my daughter Antonia was playing. Fella shot at it just for fun, I guess. Centuries from now, people will know exactly who we were and what we were about. In a remarkable way, all these holes and all these signs are very much like the pyramids of Egypt. An enormous expenditure of energy and resources to create something useless. The holes in these signs say, I was here and I wanted you to notice, but I didn't know what to do, so I did this. The single most important social institution in rural America today is the big table. In taverns and cafes, grocery stores and grain elevators all across the country, folks get together over a cup of coffee every day to discuss the business of the elders. It's the real Congress of the United States. Good morning, John. How are you today? I'm fine. Everybody's fine? Yep, I got it. There's no official notification of time or location of the big table, no official list of who can vote and who can't. In fact, no votes are ever taken, even though the debate can be hot and decisions are made. In my hometown of Danabrog, Nebraska, everyone knows that the big table meets at Harriet's Danish Cafe or Eric's Big Table Tavern or wherever, depending on who's open and what the news is. There's no set membership, but everyone knows who belongs. That's it. No eggs? <laughs> <laughs> if she had ham, you could have ham and eggs. Yeah. She had eggs. <laughs> How can you tell if you're a member of the big table? Well, for one thing, everybody insults you. Hey, you big dumb kraut, you should have stood closer to the razor. That means I need a shave. Or I see you're irrigating. 
that means my pants are stuck into the top of my boots. Spray in for mosquitoes, that means my car is burning oil again. I suppose my favorite insult is when I walk in and Bumps Nielsen snorts, whoops, the tourists are in town. I've been here for 15 years now and I'm still a tourist. I'm willing to bet that when I die, my tombstone says, Roger Welsh, tourist. <laughs> that insult, and more like it, have been honed to a fine edge. Some so esoteric or so salty, they can't be mentioned here. But all are like music to me. Well, when I first came here, there was no sign at all on the tavern. It just said open or closed. <laughs> and that was it. I thought, that's, you know, that's a small town. No, they don't know. Everybody it's knows. Closed all the time. <laughs> you know, Eric's having a good morning about 10 o'clock when the open signs are. <laughs> they say I'm accepted by the very people I'd like to have accept me. It's a nice feeling. It says we trust each other enough that we can openly talk about our weaknesses without being threatened. Carl John Lives 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 twin Lives sister. Carl's twin sister. She look anything like Carl? <laughs> she don't have a beard. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, Carl didn't have a beard. Everything except her mustache is longer on. At the big table, you find out the news of the day. Whose kid drove through town last night at 60 miles an hour? A topic that becomes particularly pointed when the father of the hot dog in question is sitting across the table. Whose pickup truck was stalled out by the bridge yesterday? Russ Powers, crack distributor cap. Or why the fire siren went off at 2 a.m.? False alarm. I don't think you have to pay for that tire. State of Nebraska was on that road. <laughs> If you need a four-foot carpenter's level, someone at the big table is sure to have one or know where you can find one. If you had one that you loaned out a year ago, chances are someone at the big table can tell you where it's wandered in the intervening year. Kenny Leach borrowed it from Steffenhagen, but right now I think it's over where Roy Hostetler's building that new hog barn. <laughs> hey, Eric, nice rolls. What's that? <laughs> Make those fresh. Hey, Eric, I still didn't get your mother's iced tea yet. Oh, you need iced tea? Yeah. <laughs> My favorite big table sessions are those where some theme develops. The fights the old timers used to have when an outsider came courting one of the local girls. The best corn picker this country has ever known, and precisely how fast he was. Fires the volunteer fire department has been called to and botched. Uh, good old Norm. <laughs> My first call on the fire department. We go walking over there and jump in. And got out going out around the corner. It was just getting dusk. And we got, you know, right out here by your place, you know. And he gets, how do you turn the road? How do we turn the siren on, Norm? Well, I don't know. Let me look over here. He's not even paying attention where he's driving his foot all the way to the floor. <laughs> turn your run over to the chief. <laughs> Storytelling sessions like this can go on for hours and are lessons in history, genealogy, sociology, and humor. Have you read that a while back about the Russian, uh, the either Burger King or McDonald's in Russia hiring the kids, you know, and the kids wouldn't, did you read that? The paper? They didn't want to work there. Yeah, they, uh, they uh, work. the kids had seen American movies and they thought all these kids, you know, at McDonald's and Burger King just partied all the time, had a ball. <laughs> so they flocked in there to fill in applications for work, you know. Yeah. And then they got trained there, you know. Well, then when they discovered they had to stand right up there and work, they quit. Yeah. They, they weren't going to work. Sounds like all the kids in our county. <laughs> the big table is not only the continuity of this community, from the farmers to the merchants, the haves to the have-nots, and the old to the young, it's also the thread that connects the community to its traditions. So the next time you see a bunch of good old boys sitting around coffee and rolls in some small town cafe, sit close enough to catch some of the conversation. Because it's authentic literature, folk literature. Faulkner, Steinbeck, Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Sandberg did. And they considered what they heard to be the poetry of the nation. So too did Willa Cather, Will Rogers, Aaron Copeland, Frost, Whistler, Wyeth. And now, a Postcards from Nebraska Extra. Things are moving faster on the rural plains, no doubt about it. Speed limits are up on the interstate and state highways. 
People are dashing around in their pickup trucks making purchases just like city folks. Kids are running faster at school. Cars are going faster on the racetracks and on the county roads. They're just here to put on a little show for you. They travel a long ways. Bernard Norbert comes to us from Pump, Nebraska. Bernard also travels. But there are some places where slow and steady still wins the race. This is one such race, a slow tractor race. No race cars like Offenhausers or Porsches here. These are tractors, McCormick Deerings, John Deers, and Cases. Speed is an issue here too, sort of. For those of you who are city folks, tractors, even old timers like my Ellis Chalmers WD, have a road gear that moves you right along when you really need to get somewhere in a hurry, 10 or 12 miles an hour. But tractors are built for power, not speed. Let's do it. Go. At the Gothenburg annual slow tractor races, not far down the road from my place at Danabrog, the so-called racers throttle down their machines to the slowest possible speed. This one is turning over at about 400 revolutions per minute, while your family automobile out there on the highway turns many times that. And an Indy 500 race car, well, enough faster that it screams rather than hums. These engines tend to pop and sputter. They are nonetheless finely tuned, sort of. Just ask Bernie Norberg of Funk, Nebraska. It's not often during a race you get to talk to a driver. Um, this is kind of an unusual sort of a race. Isn't it? Yeah, it's boring for some people. What, what do you think you're making here on this thing? How, how fast are you going? Taxes, I'm going about 200 RPM. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in a race like this, do you get a chance even to react to the crowd while they're out nope. there? Well, I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have a cup of coffee, too, while you're going. Well. <laughs> no need to worry about missing a fast pass while you go off to buy some popcorn. No call for slow motion replays. No photo finishes. There's plenty of time to mosey along and take a look at the action on this track. If you folks would like to run and get a Coke or anything, it might be a while before they get the other end. <laughs> The danger here is not so much a bone-breaking collision with another racer or a shattering encounter with the third turn wall. The big danger here is an engine missing a beat or stopping altogether. Slow, yes, but dead stop, no. Automatic disqualification, oh, no. The goal is to cover 100 yards in the longest possible time. I think Excitement right. runs high. Suspense is ever at hand. Frankly, I think the Olympics could take a few lessons here. After all, it was the turtle who won the race with the hare. It looks to me like you're pretty well ahead in this race. That is to say, yeah. pretty well behind. Can you take it easy at this point? Do you think he has some tricks up his sleeve? You never know. You never know. <laughs> Have you been surprised at some of these races when some yeah, guy somebody, managed to this? Somebody, I think I just quit on you. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a race down in Oklahoma, down in Fairview, Oklahoma, and I got halfway through and ran out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> Took a long time to live that down. The race at Gothenburg, even if it is a slow tractor race, still comes down to the throb of powerful engines, the courage of steel-nerved drivers, the skill of master mechanics, and the roar of an impassioned audience. Sort of. And a grand prize winner today in a slow race, Bernard Nordberg. Give him a big round of applause. Every day, every hour of every day, coal trains rumble down these tracks a few miles south of our farm at Danabrog. 
they leave Wyoming 500 miles to the west and thunder by on their way to the east. The little signs on the cars say that they carry something in the neighborhood of 200,000 pounds of coal apiece, 100 tons per car. A coal train is about a mile long, 110 cars, which means that every train is dragging along something like 12,000 tons, 24 million pounds of Wyoming coal. As I understand it, all this coal goes to the cities like St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago maybe, or even New York, and there it's burned to make electricity. That seems to be working out pretty well. There's plenty of this stuff in Wyoming. It's relatively inexpensive, and every pound of it we burn is that much less oil we need to import. What bothers my frugal Midwestern nature about all these trains is that the ones headed west are all empty. I have a couple of suggestions about how we can put all these westward bound empty rail cars to good use. Every winter, I see television stories from Buffalo, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Philadelphia, places like that, lamenting the problems those cities have with snow removal. Once the snow is scraped off city streets, there's nowhere to put it. So here are all these eastern cities with too much snow, and here are all these western states crying for water. So why not fill all those empty westbound coal trains with snow? Then the trains can just dump the stuff anywhere in Wyoming. God knows there's plenty of room for it there. And then it'll run down the rivers in the spring, filling dams, irrigating fields, and driving power generators. In the summer and fall, there's no snow. But during those seasons, the empty coal cars could be loaded up with billions of tons of grass clippings from suburban lawns and leaves and sticks that fall out of trees in New York, Illinois, and Missouri and are raked up by eager suburbanites. The empty coal trains could haul it out here. We don't have many trees out here in Dannebrog, so we could take those sticks and grass and throw it in the holes where we got the coal add a few million gallons of water from the snow that we hauled in the winter and we'd have America's biggest compost pile. We could take that compost, spread it two, three foot thick all over the state of Wyoming and in about three years it'd be the asparagus capital of the world. Moreover, after 10 or 15 million years, all those sticks and grass will be squished and smosed back into coal, and we can start all over again. As Mark Twain said, that's one of the best things about science. You get such a grand return of speculation from such a small investment of fact.